All right, mate, what's going on? What's up? What's really good? Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show, episode number 112, with me, your host, Agostino. How the fuck you doing? Doing all right, eh? You all right? Feeling good? Well, hydrated, well rested? Weekend's over now, isn't it? Back to reality, mother... Huh? Back to reality, mother... Oh, God. But yeah, how are you guys doing? Hope you're well. Hope you're well hydrated and well rested. I am, as you can tell. If you watch this via the video, you'll see that I am wearing a do-rag or do-rag or um, do-rage, right? Or whatever you may call these things. Um, they're specifically made for... They're specifically made to make black guys look stronger, more aggressive, look like they can sing, dance... And also, if you've got the kind of hair that needs that kind of treatment, they're meant to give you artificial waves, you know? Like the oceans, little ripples onto your hair. So then when you take it off and the girls run their fingers through your head, like, oh my God, you look like a Marion. And um, as you can tell, I do look like a Marion now with this do-rag on. But anyway, <coughs> now I've had a bad hair day, so I decided to put this do-rag on in order to kind of uh, straighten out my um, self-made locks. And then when I am able or when I have time, I'm going to go to a salon around the corner from where I live and get my head dreaded properly. It's going to cost me about 50 quid, I think. It's going to take about two hours, which is a lot of time out of my day because I'm just so busy. Um, but no, it's going to take about two hours. I'm going to get my head lock locked properly. Even if I only do it, end up doing it once because I know I'm not going to be as... I'm probably not going to be as on top of it as I should be. So I'm probably going to get it maybe done twice a year or some shit. But I want to just get it done once so I can have, so my hair can actually grow properly. But at the moment, it's not growing as well as it should do because it's not actually locked in the right way. It's kind of locked up for me twisting my hair with my hands and shit, which is probably just stopping, which is making it clump up in certain bits and just making it a bit fucked up. So hopefully once I get this done properly by a professional, I'll be um, well on my way to having my head dreaded and looking properly. And again, I'm not sure how long I'm going to keep my head dreaded. I might just end up doing it for a while and then kind of cutting off and starting it again. I'm not too sure, but um, I'll see how I feel by the time I get it done. But apart from that, how you guys been doing? All right. Doing good. Cool. Bless. I've had a pretty uneventful weekend um, due to the old sober October. Um, it's been a pretty uneventful but a pretty um, illuminating weekend. It's been very, very beneficial. It's been, um, you know, like I was saying it to the brunette the other day, um, waking up waking up not hungover is very underrated. Very, very underrated. And going out to a bar in East London somewhere for the empty even if it's a new bar that you haven't been to before is really really overrated i have to say that maybe it's because the age maybe it's because of this stage of my life i know it sounds really boring to keep talking about this sort of shit but i and it needs to be stressed like waking up on a saturday morning especially if you're working on monday to friday especially if you're working monday to friday i think if you're working during a week or if you've got shift work it might not make any difference to you but i think it will do anyway but i think waking up on that saturday um, not feeling hungover, feeling fresh, feeling ready to go, feeling like you just want to, I don't know, deciding what you want to do with your day, right? Because when you're hungover, the, the day you kind of, your body decides what it wants to do, um, depending on how you wake up, right? You wake up at around one, two from your, you know, from your alcoholic fog, you might get into a shower, you might not, you might make some, some breakfast, you might change clothes, you might not, you might decide to just... Um, stay on the fucking social media feed for the rest of the day you might sleep again you know it's just a little bit of a you're always in this kind of eternal kind of you know what do you call it it's like groundhog day you know when you're hungover it's just it, it, it feels like nothing's really happening it just keeps repeating the same actions again and again and again whereas when you're when you're not hungover and you're just fresh faced um you just wake up in the morning in the early time like i think on a saturday uh, i woke up at around what nine or eight o'clock in the morning or something like that something stupid end up um, something ridiculous which I'd never do on a Saturday unless I'm going to work out or something. I never just wake up at 8 in the morning. Um, I usually wake up around 12 or 11 or something because, you know, I'm so hungover. But this Saturday, just gone, woke up at 8, got up, had some breakfast. And it felt like I had like a big solid chunk of the day to do everything I wanted to do. I even had time to go to the bank and deposit my DJ money into the bank and shit, imagine. Which I never get a chance to do during during on the Saturday because I always just end up, even though... My national, my, my bank nationwide, they stay open until 6 p.m. on a, on a weekend, or on a Saturday anyway. So it's a lot of time, but, you know, you have to walk to Westfield, so I can, you, can, you can get a bit lazy. But I had enough time to go there, do some, do some weekend shopping for the week and shit. Like, loads of little life maintenance things I got done before 1 p.m. 
So again, like when I'm hungover, I, w- I don't wake up until 1 p.m. So imagine I was able to do that life maintenance stuff before 1 p.m., get back home, watch loads of Netflix and just chill. An amazing, an amazing day. So yeah, um, being being um, sober is really underrated, I have to say. Um, but one thing that I did notice when I DJed on the Friday at um, Tap East, which I'm doing again this Friday at Tap East in Westfield. Check that out, check that out. More information at accidentalzinger.com. But when I, what's, what I did realize when you're DJing sober is that you're much more attuned to the people around you, which can be a benefit and a negative. It's a benefit because I played probably one of my best sets I've played in a long time because I was able to kind of like guide the night. I, I wasn't like jumping from track to track. I was I was going through genres. I, I started playing loads of dub, loads of reggae. Then I went into playing um, loads of pop and loads of like um, 80s tunes. Then I went into playing a lot of this. Then I went playing some old school hip hop. Then I went to play some disco and I kind of finished it off with some, you know, some cheesy kind of, rock kind of country songs so i was able to guide through the night right playing these tracks <coughs> but i've noticed when you're drunk or when you're just a little bit tipsy you tend to like jump around a lot right you tend to be a bit a bit more schizo but when you're sober you tend to be a bit more attuned to what people are liking you get you get a feel for the room blah 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 so on um, what did i do so sunday is it so the bet the, oh the negative the negative about being so, but it's of course that you're too attuned to the room, right? So I'm flicking my head around like a meerkat, right? I can't, I'm, I'm really twitchy. I'm really sensitive to everyone around me. Um, and you get really, really tired. Because I noticed that as well on a Saturday. Because on a Saturday after after I DJ, which was pretty, it was a pretty good night. I ended up going back home around 12 or whatever. So I was, I was happy with the fact that I was DJing sober. You know, I was a little bit tired. I went, I kind of got home and just like, you know, rested a little bit, watched, watched a couple of YouTube videos and went straight to bed. Then on Saturday we had like a little birthday dinner thing for a friend of ours. Went to, we ended up going to that, which was a really good experience actually to kind of you know connect to some old school people and stuff. But what I did realize again about being in that kind of environment, especially because um, the dinner was in some restaurant, some like little um, Vietnamese was it Vietnamese or Thai? One of those restaurants in Dawson, you know, those kind of restaurants that everyone goes to to have meals and shit, and it's really packed. So we went inside there, but we had to pass all the bars and clubs along Shoreditch from Liverpool Street to like Shoreditch area. And I got to realize, okay, cool. You know, I give, I, I tell myself this myth in my head that I'll be, you know, I'll be fine. You know, I, I, I wouldn't mind going out, not drinking. It's okay. I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't be bothered. But I think my idea, my, my, the, the idea I have in my head is that going out will be the same as going out around where I live, right, in Leighton Stone, Stratford, because it's, it's not that um, busy and it's a different kind of vibe, right? It's a more of an, a mature crowd. It's not as a white girl wasted right it's like people are just out to get a bit tipsy and kind of go home no one's really want, no one's really getting on it for for real right but then to be in Shoreditch and Liverpool Street in that kind of on a Saturday night you got to see like what the what the getting on it energy is like and what it'll be like to be sober in that environment and I have to be honest I couldn't do it no way I could do it no way because um everything that I loved about Shoreditch I started to hate right the busyness of it the frantic nature girls and boys all over the place like carrying bottles of alcohol or red cups and shit really really already fucked up right but before they've even gone into the club like we are we are a big big pre-drinking nation aren't we we love a good pre-drink in this country man probably a lot more than any other country i'd assume so although that being said when i did get to, when you go to a place like berlin or even go to madrid or barcelona you do see people on the street like carrying cans of drink and shit like whatever but it's not to the extent what you see in london in london you see people with like you see a girl with a bottle of white wine right you see a guy with like a bottle of hennessy you see with a red cup that's full to the top right and you know it's not a lemonade right you see people with actual drinks like chugging drinks before they go into a club which is you know and considering you know and, and that's not to include that's not to include whatever class a drugs they might have had in their house before they left so they're already quite amped up but i guess the benefit of a place like a Berlin opposed to, in terms of behavior, clubbing behavior, the benefit of a place like Berlin, because they're so tight on the door in some places, most places most places in Berlin have somebody on the door that picks, whether it's a security guard, whether it's an actual picker, there's somebody that, that decides who comes in. So because of that, it encourages good behavior. So people, before they go into bars and clubs, have to make sure they're not too fucked up. Of course, you can find those bars and clubs that cater more to the tourist kind of um, clientele. You don't really mind how fucked up you are. They just don't want you to like make any trouble or make any mess. But for the most part, they're very, very, they, they, they make you aware that you have to be on your good behavior in order to get into the club. So it kind of, it dissuades pre-drinking for the most part. I saw in Berlin, I saw for me. Um, you, you, you can't really pre-drink as much as you think you can, right? But, in other places, it's not like that, right? 
Um, especially in London, it's not like that. Like um, people, just, you just get let in. Especially in Shoreditch or whatever Shoreditch area, um, those bars and clubs they all close at about one anyway. So they need the clientele to come in, right? So they only have a really small window of people coming into their bar, like between I don't know ten to one. So they need those people to come in and need to spend a lot, spend a lot at the bar in order to justify the wages for the staff, the wages for security guard, blah blah blah. But being in that environment, I realize I can't do that, man. I can't be in that environment completely sober. Number one because it's annoying, right? Having people around you that are super drunk and number two i wouldn't be of use right i wouldn't be fun to be around because i'd be so aware of my surroundings and also i think there's something to be said for not put i think you should be aware that if you're sober i think you should not go out with people that are drunk because there is a there is a little bit of me that's like you're kind of ruining their night i think yeah i kind of you know you're kind of ru- like they're too they are aware they are very aware that you're not drunk and it can sometimes be a little bit how do I say? It can sometimes be a little bit annoying, I think, for the person that is drinking to be reminded that they're drinking when you're not drinking. You know, that can, that, that's sometimes I can think. I think sometimes it's good to be a little bit selfless and kind of take away self out of the situation a little bit. That's what I would do anyway, if it was me. But, yeah. Um, so, so um, pretty uneventful weekend. Did the most I could do in the weekend. Kept my head down. DJing stuff and album is nice. And this weekend's an absolute chocker block because I'm DJing on Friday, DJing on Saturday, working on Saturday as well. So, I'm gonna, which is gonna be interesting because the times that I have worked on Saturday, done my shift work on Saturday, it's felt a bit. I felt like a zombie because obviously you know I've been drinking and stuff, and then you got to wake up and you have minds to switch on and do actual work, and it's you know it's actually it actually requires you to use even though some of it's a little bit. On, you, sometimes even though some of the 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 job the work that I do can you can be on autopilot, you can kind of just like you know um, go through the motions. There are bits of it that require your mental. You don't require you to turn on your brain and shit and to be a little bit active so you can't exactly just like you know go through the motions so i'm gonna have to kind of turn on my brain but i think i think this actually should be okay because i'm not really drinking i think i'll be fairly all right to do the work and kind of i hope you'll try and do that between seven and one and just smash that as soon as i can and then i can get my chill weekend started from then on anyway <coughs> let's crack on with some topics to stop waffling about the weekend oh so number one did anyone see my united play against newcastle um, if you let me get tissue here. If you didn't, I think you know what, right? Talking about tissues, my nose is gonna be eternally runny. And talking about allergies and shit, and just the fact that I'm probably pollen um, resistant or whatever it's called, right? That thing. Like I just think my nose is always gonna be runny, like always, or blocks or some shit. There's always some sort of mucus stuck in my nose, which is annoying, but hey, what can you do? Anyway, so United played um, Newcastle on Saturday. I'm sure some of you guys are aware. And um, before the match, there was a big, uh, there was a huge story that kind of came out. Um, I think in a Guardian, or was it in a Mirror or something, right? One of those journalists who was the journalist responsible for breaking the story that Moyes would get sacked. And he's also the, the journalist that was that broke the story about Louis Van Gaal going to get sacked, um, regardless of when he won the FA Cup, right? <coughs> So he revealed a story that <laughs> supposedly Mourinho was going to get sacked after the Newcastle result, regardless of the result. Um, after the Newcastle match, sorry, when we played them at home, and um, I guess for the most of the United fans, it was kind of welcome news, you know, because it felt as if like Mourinho was kind of asking to get sacked these last few weeks. You know, he's been a complete shadow of his former self. He's been he's been caught he's been kind of like um battling people and fighting people inside and outside of the club on all fronts. Um, and he's generally he's generally um, subject us to a type of football that is not really something that we are accustomed to at United, and it's not something that we're accustomed to when it comes to uh, uh, main uh, Mourinho side, right? And Mourinho side, what you're used to, uh, Mourinho side, is about being very disciplined, very compact, uh, very defensively sound, and then always kind of hitting you on a counter attack and punishing you when you give them a chance, right? But it feels as if with this United team, um, Mourinho obviously isn't happy with the centre backs that he has. Hence him trying to sign Toby Alderweireld and maybe um, kind of um, raising the interest of Toby Maguire, maybe coming or Harry Maguire, sorry, coming coming to United. So maybe he's not happy with this, the signings that he's made in terms of Lindelof and Bailly. But you know, we're not defensively sound. We don't necessarily punish teams on a counter attack as as much as we should do, or as much as we did when Ibrahimovic was around. So it doesn't necessarily look like a, a quote unquote Mourinho side, and he hasn't necessarily acted like the Mourinho that we know of old either. Because you know he's been, you know, there are moments where he's able to um, kind of um, show us his tactical prowess, right? And even in the Newcastle game with the substitutions that he's made and the changing in shape, he really did change the game in that respect. But um, 
there's been too many moments where he's been incapable of kind of like turning the tide or he's made us play a particular way that's been very, very unflattering. Um, a, a game that kind of always sticks in your throat that was really kind of hard to take was the Seville game at home where we just looked absolutely appalling. He set us up in the worst way possible. Um, but yeah, so it felt as if like welcome news, right? Okay, Marine, this Mourinho saga is going to end. He, we, we're going to put him out of his misery and we're going to eventually move on to the next top person. But for the... Man United fans were a bit more in tune with what's going on. We knew that it wasn't necessarily an issue of just the manager. It's not just a fact of changing the manager and all of a sudden everything's going to be rosy again. We knew that it was a lot. There was a lot of stuff going on in the boardroom level um, above Mourinho that was rotten to the core that needed to be kind of rooted out. A lot of it stemmed from what Ed Woodward. A lot of it also stems from the Glazers, right? The Glazers have been able to kind of milk the club um, for all its money. Right, they've been able to sign all these um, sponsorship deals with Arab Emirates and Cola and all these other stuff like Chrysler and stuff. But we haven't necessarily seen the same sort of investment um, put onto the football pitch right? at the same sort of level. We've seen some managers spend some money, but for the most part, the top, top quality talent are still not coming to United as per as as, as it was in the, in the past. Right. As years gone by. And we're also seeing a lack of footballing direction when it comes to how we recruit managers, how we recruit players, how we recruit playing staff. Like we're not necessarily seeing some a pattern or a kind of theme that's running through or a thread running through the team, right? When you look at managers, like when you look at the managers since uh, Alex Ferguson retired, David Moyes, Louis van Gaal and Jose Mourinho, the only thing that links them is that they're football managers. There's nothing else philosophically or football um, identity wise or play wise or um, recruitment policy wise that makes them, that makes them any, there's any sort of similarity. There's no similarity. They're very, very different managers. And that's the kind of been the bit of the issue that I've had um, with um, the people running the club, especially Ed Woodward in terms of the people that he's hiring. So for all the naysayers out there that want Mourinho out, I'm also what a person that would also say, if Mourinho leaves, Ed Woodward needs to leave too. Or he needs to step aside from the football inside of, of the club. Maybe maybe concentrate most on the, on the business side of it, which has been able, which has been done a really good job in uh, by all accounts, and get someone in in terms of a football director to come in and actually handle the football side of it. So that after Mourinho leaves, we have a continuation plan. So we hire a manager, and even if that manager after Mourinho is uh, isn't a success, is a complete failure. We are able to get someone else in in the same sort of mold, right? If it's the same, if it's a playing style, if it's a recruitment policy, if it's a if it's a policy about uh, bringing through youngsters through the team, like from youth and all the way through, that's to be a theme that runs through it. And it seems as if the scary part of it was that they were going to sack Mourinho and just go out and hire the next kind of like um, uh, manager that's available, that's kind of in vogue at the moment. That's that's the one that everyone's talking about. Um, case in point was Zidane. Zidane, there's no real evidence to show that he's going to be able to come and take over a club like Man United who's a bit in disarray, right, with a, with a squad that's severely imbalanced, with players who, nest, who not, don't, shouldn't necessarily be at the club, right? We've got a lot of dead weight just hanging around who are signed on to some really long contracts. Um, the recruitment hasn't been that great. There's a lot of players with question marks above their head in terms of ability. Um, there's loads of things going on in there. And to take someone like Zidane, who managed uh, one of the greatest managers sides known to man, Right, took them to Champions League glory twice. We didn't really get closer in La Liga, but you know he he showed that he could. He showed that he can cajole really good players and make them play well. But can he do that with a Man United side that hasn't necessarily got re really good players all the way through the team? We've got maybe a splattering of them right in and in and amongst the side, but overall he has to kind of like make average players play really well and make really well players play play like out of their skin sort of thing in order to kind of get a result. So that I'm a bit on the fence about that. And the fact that I've not heard United linked to any other managers apart from Zidane, right? It's just been a Zidane thing. There's no other kind of like, there's no other more interesting um, person out there like the like the, like the the young guy that um, manages Hoffenheim who we played Man City the other day. Really young dude. I think he's like 38 or something, right? He's someone's been really looked, really um, kind of lauded. The manager for Ajax, someone people say he's really good. Um, Yardem as well for Sevilla. I think manager Sevilla or Monaco. Right, those kind of man. I've not really heard managers. I've not really heard managers who I haven't heard of being mentioned. It's all kind of like the the, the current zeitgeisty kind of manager at the moment. So it's a bit concerning about that. So that kind of story rumbled, and it kind of seemed as if like some sections of the United fans wanted Mourinho just to win, just to kind of like stick out these journalists' um, asses, right? Because throughout the entire season, they've kind of it's felt as if they've kind of had a bit of an agenda after Mourinho because they all kind of want, they all want to kind of write his obituary, right? Because Mourinho um, isn't necessarily the um, the 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 cool kid anymore. There's a lot more cool kids on the block now, managerial wise, in terms of Jurgen Klopp, Pep Guardiola, Mauricio Pochettino, Mauricio uh, Mauricio Sarri. Like um, Mourinho is kind of like. Um, 
Mourinho's cool factor has kind of dwindled, especially with the style of football that he kind of prescribes to teams, right? He's very pragmatic in his approach. He doesn't, he's not necessarily after the beautiful game in that respect, right? He's, he just wants to win by all costs, right? It's all about trophies, the thing he speaks about most. So the, it seems that the journalists have kind of decided that he's not their guy anymore. So they kind of want to write his obituary and they all want to be the first person to kind of say that they predicted that, that he was going to not be the manager that he was or get his job sacked. So a lot of the, man- a lot of the fans wanted him, to be, wanted him just to kind of win against Newcastle, just to kind of stick up their ass. And, you know, by hook or crook, we kind of managed to do it in probably the best way possible. Because it seems like if that story was true and he was going to get sacked after the Newcastle game, I think the only way he was going to keep his job was if we dis- if if we came back like from two nil from two goals down and won by three two right right at the, right at the last minute sort of thing in kind of classic uh, May United style and we managed to do that. The first half was a complete nightmare, right? We went down two goals in quick succession. Um, Newcastle looked like they were Newcastle looked like Newcastle Newcastle looked like they knew that we were low on confidence. Uh, they were attacking us from all flanks. Most of their players look. We made Lucas look like they were fucking Barcelona in their pump. And it, was, it just look like one of those days, right? Look at like the players that decided that they were going to like phone this game in, get get Mourinho fired, and hopefully um, start fresh with a new manager, which is you know very upsetting for a United fan to see players who are quite average, who probably shouldn't be feeling that entitled, feel that, like they have the power, they have enough power in order to kind of get a manager out. But the truth of the matter is, they actually do, which is kind of, kind of, which kind of comes onto my second point about Gary Neville's outburst when he heard the story. Um, there are a lot of people who kind of have the idea that, you know, who have this kind of um, romantic idea that clubs should stick with managers, right? And Gary Neville's one of those managers, one of those people. And it's quite annoying to hear him speak about this sort of thing because he's kind of, he's a, he's a pundit on Sky Sports. He's been in and around football for a very long time, right? He's played at the highest level, won the highest honours, and he, he knows what the game is about, right? especially at the top level. He should know more than anyone that at a big club, right, they don't they don't wait around for the managers to kind of like come good. They can't nowadays. It's just not possible. Um, there's that famous story of Sir Ferguson was nearly going to get fired in a particular season um, because he wasn't winning and United weren't winning the league and stuff. And then a couple of seasons after that, he won the treble or whatever it may be. Right? There's, there's all these anecdotal stories you hear, right? But that era has got but has been and gone. You're not going to see a, a manager. Unless he's managing an Ajax, a Feyenoord, a Rangers, a Celtic, you're not going to see a manager like managing a club for more than 20 years. It's just not going to happen, right? Especially at the top level, it just isn't. Um, especially um, when you're when you need a manager who's able to kind of transition squads, who's able to kind of um, make bring the best out of average players. There's a lot. <coughs> It's not needed, right? But even in terms of motivation, to consistently motivate players over a 20-year period is very, very difficult. So you're not going to see it happen. So for someone like Gary Neville to always kind of uh, go with this kind of idealistic message that clubs should stick with managers and should give them time, it's really naive. And I guess maybe for Gary Neville's sake, it might be something to do with kind of his torrid time at Valencia, right? He didn't really have a good time there. I think he was there I don't, a really short time and he got fired after, uh, after a short period of time. And you got to see kind of that side of football, right? A very... Um, a kind of um very storied footballing club in terms of Valencia, right? Um, they have a lot of history in Champions League, a lot of history in La Liga. Um, and even though they're not what they used to be, the fans expect a certain level of football, a certain um level of performance. And when they're not doing that, um, the first person to go is the manager because that's the person that you can fire easier, right? You can't let go of thirteen players in a squad at one time. It's very difficult to do, right? Because you're going to need people to take them off your hands. You can't just terminate the contract of thirteen players. It's going to cost you a, a, like a ridiculous amount of money. So the one thing you can do is get rid of the manager and hope that that new energy of bringing the new manager, the new optimism, is going to hopefully get you over the line or kind of get you where you need to go to. So for Gary Neville to always say that you stick to manager is ridiculous too. And to kind of ignore um, the hostile, uh, tense, kind of combative environment Mourinho has kind of um, developed within United is really ignorant too because it's been Mourinho's kind of doing. Yes, a lot of the things haven't gone for him. Yes, he hasn't got the players that he's wanted, but he has spent a lot of money and he continually, continually keeps saying that he needs to spend more, which might be true, might not be true. But he's also... Um, at the same time that he needs to say he needs to spend more money, he's disparaging the players that he has, he has amongst him, right? He has in his squad. During the preseason, he was already bemoaning the fact that he didn't have the players that he needed and the squad was light. He was having to play young players who weren't necessarily good enough. And he was just consistently, consistently badgering on about how poor the players were in and amongst his squad. Now, even if he thinks that he's private force, I think saying that in public isn't going to really isn't going to enamor the players to you, right? The fact that he was publicly criticizing some players, all that sort of stuff, it wasn't necessarily a good thing. 
But it seemed as if some players, especially after the Newcastle game or during the Newcastle game, kind of came to the realisation that even though some of them might not like Mourinho as a person, they do they like the club more. So they kind of want just want to... And that's what, as fans, we want to see. Even if you don't like the manager, because I'm sure we've all, had, we've all had to work for managers we don't necessarily like, right? We've all done it. Everyone's done the same sort of thing. But what you need to be able to do is be professional enough just to turn up at your job and do the actual work. Right and not kind of um, throw your toys out of the pram because that's where immaturity comes into it. Right, that's where not being an adult, not being a grown up comes into it. So, um, thankfully, our players were able to do that. We turned the the, the result around. Um, three really important goals scored. You know, we had one matter scoring the free kick. We had uh, Martial scoring it to make it two one, uh, two all. Sorry, and then Ale- Alexi Sanchez to make it two two. So that was uh, to make it three two. Sorry, so that was an amazing performance. I really, I'm really happy to see us do it. Again, maybe it's a false dawn. Again, maybe it doesn't change anything with my Mourinho stance. I still think he needs to leave. I still think we need to have another manager come in. But at least, at least we've shown, some of the players have shown that they have something about them. And, you know, we're, we're a far better team than Mourinho's making it seem as. Um, especially considering what the other clubs are doing and considering, you know, he's a serial winner and stuff. That We should be doing a lot better than what we're doing at the moment. Again, I would hope if Mourinho does leave that we do get a football director come in. And um, I'd, I'd hope that Ed Woodward will step away. Even if he's... Because if I was the Glazers, I would I would be looking at Ed Woodward kind of with, with a bit of a side eye, you know? Like, for all the, he's, for all the work good that he's done, he's hired three managers. Well, he's hired three managers. Maybe you can discount Moyes because he was uh, elected by Sir Alex Ferguson. But let's say he's hired two managers since Sir Alex Ferguson has left and they've both been categorical failures, right? Um, so hopefully now we see a change... Um, we see kind of a change in environment, a change in direction. Even if Mourinho does leave, if he does stay, I don't think Aleppo can change his spots. I don't think he's suddenly going to become like, you know, a uh, positive Pete. That's not going to happen. He's just a bit, you know, he's a bit macabre at the moment. He's a little bit grumpy and shit. That's just the way he is at the moment. He's this position. He did say in the press conference once that, oh, just because I'm, j- some people can be sad on the outside, but happy on the inside and the reverse, right? But he does seem like he's super grumpy at the moment. So I don't think that's going to change, but I'm happy with the result. Now we've got the international break, which probably came at the worst time for us, right? We probably needed to kind of like carry on this momentum or maybe it's the best time because the players can kind of go away with their respective teams and not be around that toxic environment of United at the moment with the press kind of on their backs with Mourinho constantly swiping at them and the press and stuff and ex-players kind of deriding their quality. So it might be a good good thing that they're kind of going away into their national teams and stuff. But overall, man, um, happy to see where we're going at the moment. Happy to see where it is at. And I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that... um, when the players do come back and we do have our next game that we kind of carry on this good momentum going forward. What else? So yeah, that, that's my Man United hot take for the moment. I think that might be it, you know, with it being half an hour. Might be a good place to end it on the whole half an hour stage and come back on the other side or maybe tomorrow's game with them back to my one hour specials. What's I to say? Oh, have you guys seen the, um, you know what, quickly before I leave, have you guys seen the, the Tom Sachs overshoe? It looks fucking amazing. So, so, so good. So, Tom Sachs, um, um, you know, one of the most pre- prominent kind of contemporary artists who's kind of doing Nike collaborations at the moment, has done a second shoe with Nike. The first one was a Mars Yard that I've got a pair of that I've absolutely battered to death. And now the second shoe is a sort of overshoe that looks a lot like... Um, a shoe you'd wear on Mars or something, right? It looks fucking incredible. Um, there was a screening of it on Sunday, which I got tickets to go to, but I didn't go in the end because I didn't, because uh, I thought you were going to get free shoes when you go there, but I, I haven't looked on Instagram and stuff. There's no free shoes, just a bit of popcorn given from the guys at Gastro. Get a Gastro. But these shoes look incredible. I've got them up on the screen now. I can't wait for them to come out. I think they come out uh, at DSM October 11th, and then I think they're going to get a wider release on um i think december or something i saw maybe was it december or november or something on those kind of lines but they look fucking incredible they look really fucking good man i can't wait i can't wait to get a pair of these when they come out um i remember seeing a leaked picture of these on instagram once before and they were the same colorway but they were just um without the kind of overshoe sock thing on it i'm not sure if those are going to come out as a as like a kind of more of a wider release or if these are going to be the wider release um, again, because I'm not sure how much it must cost to manufacture a shoe of this kind of quality, but they just look insane, man. Look at them. Just look at them. Like, you know, the straps on the f- on the two straps, stock on the front. It's just looking. It's it's kind of the perfect shoe for winter as well, if you think about it. And there's a little video here as well that I uh, actually play that looks really cool. Put the sound up on here.
It looks so fucking cool. Um, and it's funny because I think the video that was made on it, if you go on Tom Sachs' um, in- Instagram, so T-O-M-S-A-C-H-S, you'll see the video of it. I'm um, supposedly uh, Casey Neistat's brother, Van Van Neistat. He still works at um, Tom Sachs. I remember in the beginning when Casey first kind of rose with prominence, I remember that's where I kind of found him. I kind of found out about Casey Neistat through Tom Sachs studio and stuff. He used to do a lot of videos. So that kind of you know, that style that, that Casey does with the kind of felt tip pen and the sort of like moving of the hands and the and the whole like studio arrangement and shit. That all comes from Tom Sachs Studios. That kind of aesthetic of like making sure your studio is kind of set in a particular sort of way. Um, and I remember that kind of style started from there. And I remember that's where I kind of found out about the Neistat brothers when they did their HBO show. And um, Casey's brother still kind of works there, does some stuff with Tom Sachs Studios. That's pretty cool. But the shoe looks fucking incredible. And again, that's where, that's where I, the, that's where I think we always hoped collaborations would go to, right? You remember when I was like fully in, involved in the whole sneaker culture world? That's where that's what that's what separated the best the the kind of like the top tier people from like the wannabes, right? Just changing a color of a shoe was good enough sometimes back then because Nike and some of the bigger brands were unable to kind of um, re-release G, re-release kind of OG colorways because there wasn't a demand for it. But nowadays there is a demand, right? If you if you bring out an Air Max ninety four and Air Max one eighty in the original colorways, they're gonna sell out as as what well, they're gonna sell as well as a limited edition shoe even though you're maybe manufacturing more of them because there's a demand for the vintage kind of like OG colorways because everyone's into the whole 90s culture, all that sort of shit, right? But there's a demand for it. Back then, there wasn't. Back then, everyone wanted fucking crazy colorways, so people were just pumping out crazy colorways. But the thing that I really did appreciate with some with some companies or some brands when they did collaborations was when they took like a, a, a normal silhouette and kind of added their sort of twist on it, right? When you got an Air Force One and you removed the swoosh and you took away the zips, so you took away the laces or you kind of made it um, an elastic, um, you kind of took off the foxing on it or you changed kind of the stitching. Like li- little, like actual details of the actual shoe will change that made the actual shoe special as opposed to just the colorways because the way we kind of got around it, I know some of my friends, what we did was that we just did Nike IDs, right? If we wanted to kind of get an OG colorway or we kind of wanted to make an, a particular type of shoe or if you're really talented, you'll kind of paint it yourself, right? With like Angelus kind of like um, uh, acrylic paint. But it's cool to see nowadays with the collaboration with a cold wall, with the collaboration that Off White did, with the stuff that Tom Sachs is doing, where you're taking a shoe, or even even the Mars Yard, where you're taking like an SFB sole and you're putting it on another shoe and you're kind of fusing them together. I like that whole idea behind like kind of making an actual shoe, an actual trainer, and you kind of get the idea from um, you kind of get that feeling, that kind of aesthetic from that Instagram account called Studio Haggle. Or Studio Hadrel, it's like Studio and Hadrel, but H A G E L. They do like kind of t- prototypes, like product design sort of kind of studio where they take like a shoe. I think they did kind of the same sort of thing with the Mars Yard overshoe with a Cortez. It sort of had that same sort of like socky kind of overshoe where you can kind of zip it up. And I think they've done the same. I think they've taken a little bit of the design elements from that and did it, um, added it to the Kendrick Lamar Cortez, if you've seen that. There's a Kendrick Lamar Cortez coming out soon that's, that's laceless, but has like a zip pull on the back of the heel, which I'm assuming um, links up to the front of the shoe where you can kind of like pull it um, a little bit tighter so you can kind of hold your foot in place so I'm, I like this kind of idea of like taking a shoe and then kind of actually designing a shoe not just necessarily changing the colorway and hopefully that that make long continue I've, even um was it junior Watanabe? was it spring uh 2018 collection where he did those um races and they're all straight um sort of like a triple sole where they'll kind of all put on top of each other that's what you want to see more of going forward so yeah maybe we're going to see a lot more of that in the future but anyway, um, that's it for me at the moment. A little quick podcast for now, just kind of update you on the week's events and stuff or weekend's events. I'll be back um, tomorrow with a breakdown of some of the UFC 229, which was an absolute fucking barnstormer. I'm sure some of you have seen all the gifts and all the videos of Khabib Nurmagomedov uh, jumping, out the <coughs> jumping out the octagon and, you know, fly kicking uh, Dylan Dennis when he's outside and, you know, choking or before that, choking out Conor McGregor cranking it nearly cranking half his neck off before herb dean kind of pulled his arms away so i'll break down some of the stuff from that and um some of the other topics i've got as well in tomorrow's show but um before that thank you again for tuning in episode number 112 of the Zinger show i'll see you guys again tomorrow so take care and uh we should take care and good night no not take care and good night i should say take care in general take care and have a good one see you again tomorrow peace